Well, good afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, Arabic Christian Perspective and Pastor George Sayeg for uh, hosting these debates. Jesus and Muhammad are the two people I've studied most in my life. And uh, so I'm excited that uh, the identities of both men will be debated uh, today. I'd also like to thank Jalal for his excellent opening statement and for agreeing to debate a topic as difficult as the one before us. I've been studying the life of Muhammad on and off for about 14 years now. I began studying Islam when I was still an atheist, even before I ever investigated Christianity. And after I became a Christian, I studied Islam even more, mostly because uh, during the last decade or so, two of my best friends had been dedicated Muslims. And uh, they both loved arguing. Uh, oh, the times we shared. Uh, <laughs> so um, uh, I ended up examining the evidence for Islam over a period of several years in the context of uh, these two close friendships. Uh, I'm always grateful for every opportunity to learn more about Muhammad, which is why I've been looking forward to this exchange with Jalal. Here in my opening statement, I'm going to explain why I don't believe Muhammad was a prophet. You can do whatever you want with the information I present. If it's not enough for you, fine. I'm telling you why uh, I do not believe in Muhammad. Um, I'll do this by responding to some common Muslim arguments and by offering a positive case against the reliability of Muhammad, I'll also try to address as many of Jalal's claims as time allows. Um, to begin, let's consider some of the standard arguments used by Muslims to show that Muhammad was a prophet. Since I started dialoguing with Muslims in the 1990s, I've actually been given uh, dozens of arguments for the prophethood of Muhammad, some worse than others. Uh, probably the least persuasive er argument I was ever given by a Muslim is what I call the Muhammad Ali argument. Uh, a Muslim said to me, look, David, Muhammad Ali was the greatest boxer in history, and he converted to what? Islam. So unless you can show that an even greater athlete converted to Christianity, you should admit that Islam is true. I get arguments like that all the time. Now, to be fair, I've also heard some, uh, some awful arguments for Christianity. When I was uh, 15, I announced to my uncle that I was an atheist. And he said, you need your butt whipped. Only his, uh, his language was much more colorful. Uh, and by the way, in, in logic, that's called the argument ad boculum, the argument from a stick. Agree with me or I'm going to hit you. So there are plenty of ar bad arguments for Islam and for every other religion in the world. The question for us is whether there are any good arguments uh, for Islam. So let's look at some of the contenders. The first argument I was ever given for Islam was the argument from biblical prophecy. Uh, most Muslims believe that there are prophecies about Muhammad in the Old and New Testaments, and the Quran itself teaches this in Surah 7, 157. Jalal also makes this claim on page 24 of his book, Muhammad's Role in Islam. So my Muslim friends started giving me passages from the Bible that supposedly predict uh, the coming of Muhammad. As I examine these passages, along with the Muslim uh, writings that defend this argument, I have to say I became quite disturbed because I noticed that Muslim apologists were ripping verses out of context and completely misrepresenting what the Bible actually says. In the um, Muslim writings and pamphlets I was reading, it was quite common to hear uh, the writers make claims based on the Hebrew or the Greek text of the Bible. Oh, the Hebrew word here proves our case. The Greek word in this verse means such and such. And of course, I would immediately look up the words in a Greek, Hebrew or Greek dictionary and I would find over and over again that some Muslim apologists were making false claims. Keep in mind, this was my first impression of Muslim apologetics. And it was misrepresentation, misquotation, and mistranslation. I had to ask myself there at the very beginning, if Islam is the true religion, why would Muslims have to resort to these tactics? So after carefully considering the Muslim argument, uh, I was forced to reject the argument from biblical prophecy, especially when I realized that according to the criteria laid down in the Old and New Testaments, Muhammad was a false prophet. Deuteronomy 18.20 and Galatians 1.8 declare that Muhammad cannot be a prophet of God. How then can Muslims appeal to the Bible for support? So my first impression of Muslim apologetics was not favorable. The next argument Muslims gave me wasn't much better. My friend Anthony, who was a convert to Islam, sat me down in front of a TV, put in a video, and told me that the scientific evidence for Islam was going to blow my mind. Uh, so I finally encountered the infamous argument from scientific accuracy, which claims that we know Muhammad was a prophet because of all the miraculous scientific insights in the Quran and the Hadith. 
I have to say that I wasn't very impressed by the evidence I saw in this video. Uh, the narrator of the film, he had a cool British accent, but he would say things like, according to Surah 1666, cows produce milk from what they eat. How could Muhammad have known this? I, I don't know, by watching a cow? Now, I, I have to say, based on the examples I've examined, I've never seen anything that looks like a miraculous scientific insight in either the Quran or the Hadith. Um, but even so, there's a tremendous problem with this argument. What do you do with all the scientific inaccuracies in the Quran and Hadith? I'll give you a few examples. In Sahih al-Bukhari, number 3320, Muhammad tells his followers, if a fly falls into your drink, dunk the fly in the drink, because one of the fly's wings has a disease, but the other wing has the cure for the disease. Is that scientifically correct? No. Flies don't spread cures for diseases on their wings. According to both Sahih al-Bukhari, number 3326, and Sahih Muslim, number 6809, Muhammad told his followers that Adam was 90 feet tall and that people had been shrinking since the time of Adam. Is that true? No, it's physically impossible for a human being to be anywhere near that tall. In Sunan Abu Dawud, uh, number 67, we read about a situation in which some Muslims needed water. They asked Muhammad whether it was okay to use water from the well of Buddha, which was filled with dead dogs, used menstrual cloths, and human excrement. Muhammad replied, truly, water is clean and is not defiled by anything. Really? Not even by dead animals and human waste? So we read things like this in the Hadith. But what about the Quran? Well, Surah 1886 tells us that Alexander the Great traveled so far west he found the place where the sun sets. According to the Quran, the sun sets in a pool of murky water. Do you know what stars are, according to Muhammad? Surah 37, Surah 67, 5, and the Hadith tell us that stars are missiles that God uses to shoot demons when they try to sneak into heaven. When you see a shooting star, it's because God became angry and hurled a missile, hurled a star at a demon. In Surah 27, ants talk to Solomon. In Surah 86, we learn that sperm are produced between the ribs and the spine. And according to several verses in the Quran, human beings go through a blood clot stage during embryological development. Obviously, obviously, Muhammad made many claims that are scientifically false. Now, can Muslims reinterpret them? Of course they can, and they do. But why should non-Muslims reinterpret these passages, passages which are perfectly clear and completely false? You see... The argument from scientific accuracy is circular. We have to assume from the beginning that Muhammad was a prophet, so that when we go out and investigate and we find all the scientific errors, we can reinterpret them based on our assumption that Muhammad was a prophet. And it's just circular to make that assumption in an argument meant to show that Muhammad was a prophet. So this argument fails too. The third argument I encountered in my search for some kind of evidence uh, for Islam was the argument from literary excellence, which comes straight out of the Quran. I think Jalal is the first Muslim I've debated who, who's actually uh, saying something in favor of this argument, and, and I like that. This is the central argument of the Quran. Uh, Surah 223 says, if you are in doubt as to that which we have revealed to our servant, then produce a chapter like it, and call on your witnesses besides Allah, if you are truthful. So the claim is this. Each chapter of the Quran is so amazing that it could only come from God. And if you want to prove that it's not from God, just try to write something like it. Now that is a very, very strange challenge. Muhammad says, in effect, my poetry is better than your poetry, therefore my poetry is the inspired word of God. Now there's something very weird about that. Suppose Mozart had said, if my symphonies are better than your symphonies, then my symphonies must be the inspired music of God. Or suppose Shakespeare had said, if my plays are better than your plays, then I must be a prophet. There's something extremely odd about this claim, and yet this, again, is the central argument offered by the Quran. In case you've never read a chapter of the Quran, I'll give you an example. This is Surah 109. Say, O unbelievers, I do not serve that which you serve, nor do you serve him whom I serve, nor am I going to serve that which you serve, nor are you going to serve him whom I serve. You shall have your religion, and I shall have my religion. That's a surah. It's one of the short ones. Some are much longer. The question is, are these words so amazing that they could only come from God? 
Obviously not. So at this point, Muslims usually say, well, it only works in Arabic. You can't understand it if you don't speak Arabic. And my question there would be, well, why on earth did God give as his main argument an argument which n practically no one in the world can even understand? I don't know. But here, here again, I just have no clue what Muslims could possibly mean. Surah 109, like every other surah in the Quran, is composed of words, one after another, arranged to convey some sort of meaning. If you say that only God could write the Arabic version of this surah, you're saying that a human being couldn't possibly put words in the order we find in the Arabic version of Surah 109. And here I just have no clue what Muslims can possibly mean. Human beings can put words in whatever order we like. And so the Muslim claim simply makes no sense to me. Um, but even if we do take the argument from literary excellence uh, seriously, we only have to do a little historical research to learn that Muhammad's challenge has been met over and over and over again for nearly 14 centuries. Now Jalal disagrees, and I know the Muslims in the room are thinking, no, everyone who has tried has failed. Failed according to whom? To Muslims? Guess what? Muslims aren't the judges here. This is a challenge for unbelievers. Supposedly, when a person tries to write something like a chapter of the Quran, he'll realize that it just can't be done, and he'll feel ashamed. But that's not what happened. Not now, not 14 centuries ago. And we know this even from the early Muslim records. In the early Muslim sources, we read about a man named Al-Nadir. Al-Nadir used to follow Muhammad around in Mecca. And whenever Muhammad would uh, recite a passage of the Quran, Al-Nadir would say, I can tell a better story than that. And he would stand up and recite some verses of his own. And then he would challenge the listeners and say, in what way is Muhammad's story better than mine? What was he doing? He was doing exactly what the Quran says unbelievers can't do. And people have been doing it ever since. Um, now, by the time I had reached this point in my investigation, uh, it was clear to me that all of the main arguments for Islam are based on either obviously false premises or obviously flawed logic. But I kept studying. And I noticed that there was one more argument that needed a closer look, the argument from moral excellence. The argument for moral excellence goes something like this. If you look at the life of Muhammad, you'll see that he was so amazing, that his character was so flawless, that he was so wonderful, he must be a prophet of God. We heard some of this from Jalal. Uh, and it's quite common to hear Muslims say things like, uh, Muhammad liberated women. He was against slavery and cruelty. He set free the people in bonds. And here, I, I confess, I have absolutely no clue uh, what sources Muslims are reading when they say some of these, th these things. Now, I agree with Jalal that we have to give both the positive and the negative. And I agree, Muhammad had many, I say many, good qualities. In fact, I'll say here, I'm on record, for about the first 50 years of Muhammad's life, I like Muhammad. I like Muhammad. His last 12 years or so where I find, uh, where I have a really big problem. Um, and here's why. The early Muslim sources are filled with acts of extreme brutality by Muhammad and his men. Assassinations, beheadings, and torture. We find Muhammad ordering his followers to kill people who insult him, to kill people who write poetry against Muslims, and of course to kill people who leave Islam. If you'd like details, let me know. I'd be happy to share them. Now, as Muslims in the room know, the Quran allows men to have sex with their slave girls and female captives, those whom your right hands possess. We find this in Surah 424, 236, and 7030. Surah 3350 specifically grants Muhammad the right to have sex with his slave girls, and we know that he took advantage of this verse because he got one of them pregnant. Muhammad allowed his followers to have sex with captives who were still married. He allowed his followers to have sex with women whose families had just been annihilated, women who were about to be sold into slavery. And Jalal says this is clearly, clearly the greatest man ever. I think many people would disagree here. Another concern I'll point out is Muhammad's relationship uh, with Aisha. It's a historical fact that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl named Aisha. Now, apparently, it was acceptable in 7th century Arabia for a 52-year-old man to have sex with a nine-year-old girl. My only objection here is, is this what we would expect from God's last and greatest messenger? 
Keep in mind, Muhammad is supposed to be an example for all mankind. And I just think that many people, especially in the West, would agree with me when I say, history's greatest man probably shouldn't be having sex with a girl who, according to Muslim records, was still playing with dolls. This is just a sample of the details we find in the early Muslim literature. There's much more we could talk about. Muhammad winning converts by robbing caravans. Muhammad starting a war with Mecca when he had a chance to live in peace in Medina. Muhammad beheading hundreds of Jews for trying to defend themselves. Muhammad enslaving people, selling slaves, trading slaves, and so on. But you get the picture. No one who isn't already a Muslim is going to look at Muhammad's life and conclude that because of his great character, he must be a prophet. Now again, Muhammad had many good characteristics. All I'm saying is, when you say someone is the greatest, that is a very strong claim. And when we go and investigate that, per that person's life, we shouldn't find things like this, but we do, and many more. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, you can do whatever you want with the character issues I'm bringing up. Reinterpret them. Pretend they never happened. Throw out all the evidence. The only point I'm making uh, is that the argument for moral excellence, much like the other arguments we've examined, is doomed to failure. Now, these are the main arguments I've, uh, I've heard since I've been dialoguing with Muslims. Jalal has offered a few more. He says, Muhammad said that Islam would spread, and it did. Well, that's pretty much every false religion that's ever come. So if we're just looking at that, guess what? Jesus said Christianity was going to spread. Uh, Muhammad said Islam was going to spread. Joseph Smith said Mormonism was going to spread. And some false religions actually spread. And so this, it doesn't prove it's false, but it certainly doesn't prove it's true. Um, he said Islam uh, conquered much territory. Uh, it spread and, you know, eventually overcame all these, uh, all these other powers. Well, what's the argument here? It seems like he's saying if someone is a prophet, he's going to be successful and his message is going to spread and be victorious. Well, what in the world do you do with Jesus then? The Muslim view of Jesus, Jesus came along, he preached a message, and then it was completely overcome almost immediately after he died. The Apostle Paul came in, completely corrupted everything, and then the false religion of Christianity spread throughout the world. What did Jesus accomplish? In what way was Jesus, the Muslim view of Jesus, in what way was he successful? I can't think of any way Jesus was successful. Uh, so here, I don't see how, as a Muslim, you can make this argument that, you know, prophet's going to be successful. And by the way, we know, historically, lots of false prophets are successful in spreading their message. Um, Jalal says, well, Muhammad shunned the idols. Well, not all of them. What do you do with the black stone? You kiss it as a Muslim. So, I'm not sure about that one. Uh, all right. Uh, he says the argument from fulfilled prophecy. Um, he brought up the fact that I do object to the argument from fulfilled prophecy. Now, to be clear, I think that fulfilled prophecies do count as some kind of evidence. My objection is that Muhammad said they don't. Muhammad said he was asked about the foretellers, people who are predicting the future. People came up to him, Muhammad, these people are predicting the future and they're getting it right. What do we do? He says, don't believe them. That's no evidence at all. They could be getting this from evil jinn. So if Muhammad, if you're trying to get me to believe in Muhammad and you want me to assume here from the beginning that he was wrong when he claims about what, uh, what counts as evidence, I just have no clue what you could possibly mean. You're asking me to assume at the beginning of this argument that Muhammad was wrong when he talked about what qualifies as evidence. And there's something just strange about that. Now, my position is I don't think Muhammad actually did uh, predict anything uh, that would qualify as miraculous. Uh, Jalal talked about Muhammad saying the Romans would be victorious eventually, you know, within a certain number of years. Well, I mean, think about that. You're saying, okay, the Roman, the Roman Empire suffered a defeat, but they're going to win here pretty soon. What are the odds that the Roman Empire is going to come back and win a fight? I don't know, about 99%? I mean, that would be like the United States suffering a defeat somewhere uh, tomorrow, and you say, within several years, the United States is going to win a big victory. Well, that wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't take a profit to know that. There are, of course, other arguments that Muslims use, but I think they're even weaker than the ones we've uh, discussed so far. Um, so I would say that all of the arguments that Muslims use to show that Muhammad was a prophet fail if they're, used, if they're used to try and convince someone who's not already a Muslim and someone who's willing to uh, do some research. Uh, so I'd say there's no good argument for Islam anywhere. I think it's important to note, however, that this lack of evidence by itself would not show that Muhammad was a false prophet. 
a Muslim could agree with everything I've said so far and reply, true, there's no good evidence for our view, uh, but we believe in Muhammad, we can believe in Muhammad by faith. Fair enough. The question we have to ask now then is whether there are any good reasons to reject Muhammad as a prophet. You see, if there's no good evidence for Muhammad, but there is good evidence against Muhammad, then it would simply be irrational for someone who knows the facts to believe in Islam. Uh, so let's look at a few reasons for rejecting Muhammad. First, Islam is plagued, plagued by historical problems. From a Christian perspective, Muhammad's most interesting teachings are his teachings about Jesus. Um, Jalal will be debating Jesus deity in a little while, but I think it's important to note here that Muhammad made several claims about Jesus that just don't line up with history. For instance, Jesus' death by crucifixion is regarded by many historians, even non-Christian historians, as one of the best established facts of ancient history. And yet in the Quran, Surah 4, 157, we read that Jesus wasn't killed and wasn't even crucified. Now that's a problem. You see, if Muhammad makes a claim that's open to historical investigation, then when we go out and we do the historical research, we should find that it lines up with Muhammad's claim. But that's not what we find. Islam faces this problem not only when we consider Jesus' death, but also when we consider his birth. According to Surah 19, Jesus began preaching as soon as he came out of Mary's womb. Now, the obvious, now the obvious difficulty here is that no one in Muhammad's time, uh, I mean, no one in Jesus' time, in the early Christian period, mentioned this. And surely some of these early Christians would have mentioned it, uh, if it were true. Keep in mind, they're trying to prove that Jesus is the one. Uh, but there's an even bigger problem. We know where this story comes from. It comes from the Arabic infancy gospel, which scholars unanimously reject as an obvious forgery. This is a pattern we find over and over again when we examine the Quran. Muhammad tells a story, and we can trace the story back to a forgery or to some other historically inaccurate account. The Quran contains details about Cain and Abel, Abraham, Solomon, Jesus, Mary, that aren't in the Bible. But as soon as we start digging deeper, we find where they come from, and they come from all sorts of, uh, all sorts of forgeries. These are frauds, and yet they ended up in the Quran. It's not surprising, then, to read in Surah 625, 831, and 25.5 that Muhammad's contemporaries were accusing him of copying various tales in the Quran from earlier writers. Needless to say, these historical inaccuracies uh, certainly call into question uh, Muslim beliefs about the origin of the Quran. Second, Muslims often claim that Muhammad's revelations were consistent with those of the messengers who came before him. And as Jalal pointed out, uh, this is true with doctrines such as monotheism. Uh, the problem here is that as soon as we start examining these prior revelations, we find that they just don't line up with Muhammad's teachings. This is obvious when it comes to doctrines such as uh, Jesus' deity and sacrificial death, doctrines which are clearly taught in the New Testament, but which were foretold even in the Old Testament. But it's important to keep in mind that Muhammad's message was at odds with prior, prior revelations in many other respects. Think about the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust, or the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Here Jesus tells us that God's love is universal. God loves everyone, male and female, young and old, black and white, Christian, Jew, Muslim, atheist. But what does the Quran say? Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. Surah 2, 190. Allah does not love any ungrateful sinner. Surah 2, 276. Allah does not love the unbelievers. Surah 332. Allah does not love the unjust. Surah 357. Allah does not love him who is proud. Surah 436. According to the Quran, God only loves those who first love him. Jalal admits this in his book, Muhammad's Role in Islam. On page 24, Jalal says, on page 44, Jalal says that we have to earn God's love and that God will only love us if we first love Muhammad. So God's love is conditional in the Quran. But this is the sort of love that Jesus said is no better than the love of tax collectors and sinners. Consider also the next verse in Matthew, where Jesus says, If you greet only your brothers, 
What more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? This follows Jesus' command to love even our enemies. Christians are commanded to greet everyone in love. But what does Muhammad teach? Let not the believers take the unbelievers for friends. Surah 328. Do not take the Jews and Christians for friends. They are friends of each other. Surah 551. What does Muhammad say about greeting non-Muslims? Do not give the people of the book the greeting first. Force them to the narrowest part of the road. But Muslims say, no, no, Muhammad loves the, loves the Jews and Christians. Uh, then why does he say in Sahih Muslim, I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. Why does he attempt to humiliate, and we know from Muslim sources that was the purpose, why does he attempt to humiliate Jews and Christians by forcing us to pay the jizya tax? And by the way, Christians and Jews, we have it good compared to the polytheists, the pagans. So why is there such harsh treatment for non-Muslims? Because God does not love us, according to the Quran, according to Muhammad, and according to Jalal. Is Muhammad's message consistent with the message of universal love brought by Jesus? No, my friends. And Jesus said that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Since Muhammad's love for others was no better than that of the scribes and Pharisees. Muhammad was not part of the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus himself tells us this. So how then can, God, can Muhammad be God's last and greatest prophet when according to Jesus, Muhammad cannot be a prophet at all? Third, some of Muhammad's revelations seem entirely too convenient, morally convenient. The only point of certain verses in the Quran is to justify Muhammad's behavior, behavior which is sometimes very good, sometimes questionable. For instance, consider Muhammad's wives. Uh, Surah 4.3 says that Muslims can marry up to four women. But we know from history that Muhammad had a lot more than four wives. Al-Tabari says that Muhammad married 15 women and consummated his marriages with 13 women. We also know from references in Abu Qari that Muhammad had at least nine wives at one time, some say 11. So if the Quran says that men are allowed to have no more than four wives, why did Muhammad get more? Well, we find the answer in Surah 3350, which says that Muhammad, and only Muhammad, could have as many wives as he wanted. Think about that. The Quran lays down a rule for Muslims, saying that they can have up to four wives. But Muhammad receives another revelation, giving him and him alone special moral privileges. All I can say is that it looks awfully suspicious when a prophet receives revelations and those revelations give him more sexual partners than anyone else. Let's look at another morally convenient revelation. Muhammad had an adopted son named Zayd, who was called Zayd bin Muhammad, Zayd son of Muhammad. One day Muhammad went to visit him and was greeted by Zayd's wife, Zainab, who was one of the most beautiful women in Arabia and who was wearing, wearing very little clothing at the time. Here's what happened according to Al-Tabari. She jumped up in haste and excited the admiration of the messenger of God, so that he turned away murmuring something that could scarcely be understood. However, he did say overtly, Glory be to God the Almighty, glory be to God who causes hearts to turn. When Zayd found out that Muhammad was attracted to his wife, he decided to divorce her. Muhammad, of course, uh, was worried about what people might think, so he said, no, keep your wife. But by that time, Zainab had found out that Muhammad was attracted to her, and so she began despising her husband. And Zayd, wanting to give his adopted father whatever he wanted, divorced his wife. Muhammad was still worried about what people might think if he married Zainab, but then, not surprisingly, he began receiving revelations to justify the marriage. So 33.5 and 33.37 came just in time to rescue Muhammad from a scandal, a scandal of taking the wife of his own adopted son. Here again, Muhammad's revelations seem too convenient. The Quran is supposed to exist eternally in heaven. And yet parts of it have more to do with justifying Muhammad's behavior than with guiding humanity. Now, if what I just said offends you, uh, don't take my word for it. Aisha herself, Muhammad's favorite wife after Khadija, noticed this. In Sahih al-Bukhari, number 4788, Muhammad receives one of his uh, convenient revelations. And Aisha says to him, I feel that your Lord hastens in fulfilling your wishes and desires. Indeed. Fourth. There are also some spiritual issues that call Muhammad's reliability into question. 
I'm running out of time, so I'll go through this quickly. Uh, we know from Muslim records that Muhammad, uh, when Muhammad began receiving revelations, he thought that he was demon-possessed. Jalal says, well, of course, what's he going to think seeing an angel? Um, and I think that's somewhat valid, but we also have to keep in mind that Muhammad's impression of whatever this was, was negative. And if Muhammad, upon seeing this, uh, wasn't convinced immediately that this was uh, good and divine, how are we, so many years later, supposed to conclude automatically that this was indeed the angel Gabriel? Um, but this isn't the only problem. Uh, think about the satanic verses, the verses that Muhammad delivered to his followers and later claimed were from the devil. I'll go ahead and give you the verses. It says, Have you not heard of Alat and Alusa and Manat, the third, the other? These are the exalted cranes whose intercession is to be hoped for. Now, here Muhammad actually promotes polytheism very shortly. Uh, Jalal says this is probably not true. I have a number of sources that say otherwise. We can go into that later. Um, but he says it doesn't matter because if you keep reading the story, you'll find that, uh, that you know, Gabriel came back and vindicated Muhammad. Well, if Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan when the, the satanic verses came, how am I supposed to believe him when he says later on Gabriel came back and fixed things? I just don't see how I can trust a person who admittedly delivers revelations from the devil. So those are problems. It's also interesting to note that at one point uh, late in life, Muhammad was the victim of a magic spell that lasted about a year. According to several passages in Al-Bukhari, one of the Jews stole Muhammad's hairbrush and used it to cast a spell on him. The spell made him delusional. So according to Muslim sources, God's greatest prophet, at the peak of his prophetic power, was the victim of black magic that gave him false beliefs and delusional thoughts for a year. Even if you believe in him, you should at least understand why this would cause uh, some problems for other people to believe it. Now let's put all this together. Muhammad made certain claims that can be investigated historically, and when we investigate them, we find that these claims are false. Muhammad's teachings were not consistent with previous revelations, and according to Jesus himself, Muhammad was not part of the kingdom of God. We know that some of Muhammad's revelations were awfully convenient, giving him special moral privileges. Beyond this, the evidence shows, one, that Muhammad originally thought he was demon-possessed, two, that he delivered verses from Satan, three, that people could cast spells on him, and, uh, by the way, he, he became suicidal as a result of this, uh, this whole fiasco. So I would say that these facts, combined with a complete lack of evidence, lack of any good evidence for Islam, are enough to rule out Muhammad as a prophet. And, by the way, the case that I presented uh, right now is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Jalal says he would need much more time to, uh, to fully explain all the details about how great Muhammad was. I think I would need much longer as well to explain all the reasons for rejecting Muhammad. So I look forward to the rest of the exchange.